Hi, everyone. So I would like you, I'm the host now, so I, I have to get used to that system. Andre, um, explain me a little bit um, today how that works. So I prepared a few things for you and I thought we're going to do it a bit different than normally because um, before we may chat with like Philip and me or Andre and me and, and we decided that uh, tonight I would like that just one pilot, for example, that I pretty much explain what I think is important for training and tactics and so on. And of course, you're always welcome to, um, to ask questions. If you could write them as a chat, would be easier for now. I will also at the end, of course, um, release all the microphones so you can, um, you can talk to me, of course, and ask questions. And in general, I just want to say, I mean, I will tell you guys my opinion now about tactics and so on. And of course, if you ask somebody else, he will give you some other answers. I think that's part of the game. But I hope, um, especially if we upload that thing one on YouTube later on, that uh, there's for everyone a little bit of a, a piece inside which, which helps. So welcome everyone. And then I would like, I start with that first page to see what is happening here. So look at this. So there was Hof Hegnenberg last year. <clears throat> you can see there's quite a big crowd of people flying there. And you can see we have amazing weather. So I want to let you know what is the basics to be a good pilot, of course. So basically, you know that thing, you know that triangle, you all know that thing. And at the end of the day, it has to be said that it doesn't matter if you're flying light class, board class, one to three, or scale class. At the end of the day, it's about the task of that triangle, which is combined with a certain altitude you enter in. You have a time window between 20 and 30 minutes. And the guy which finished as many laps or the same laps as the second one in a faster time wins. So that's basically what it is. And then what are the basics of the GPS flying? All right, so what skills you have to have? I would say you have to be able to fly around the triangle. That's the first task, <laughs> uh, first of all. Then you have to be a pilot which knows how to fly in thermals. And the last thing is, you have to be able to fly a certain time, which means for the light class, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. So you, you need to be able to stay up in the air, in the thermal, and get around the triangle as many times as you can. And then there is two words which I want to say, which are below. There's the passive flying and the progressive flying. So basically, that's a very important one. Um, a pilot which flies very passive means he's uh, thermaling a lot. So basically, he enters the triangle thermals all, uh, all 20, 30 minutes and then continues to fly when it's basically a little bit too late. On the other hand, you have the pilots which fly a bit uh, too progressive, which means they enter the course, they go around the triangle and they basically forget the thermal and they will uh, be on the ground pretty quickly. All right. Is there any questions so far there? Do share anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to ask a bit uh, more specific. All right, so I would say I taken this example how I entered that scene. So now we are in 2020. Hello. I, yes. Uh, the question is that you are not sharing the screen. Oh, you must be joking. Okay. Good point. All right. So. <laughs> now I do, right? Can yes. you see it now? Yes. Oh, much better, much better. Okay, lesson learned again. <laughs> so that's just the basics again. Nothing special about it. Um, as you see below, the passive flying and the progressive flying is something which I want to go um, deeper into it afterwards. 
that's basically it. So going back to what I would like to say about my personal flying, and um, when I entered the scene, I I got that GPS um, transmitter from Andrew that was back then, it was the T3000, and I went to the field and I learned how to fly. And I always knew that I'm probably able to fly around the triangle, but I wasn't really able um, to, to, to do tactics and, and fly a certain time. So basically, at the end of the day, the best pilot wins, which is achieving all those three parameters, which, which means he needs to be able to fly the triangle at a certain index as fast as he can. He needs to be able to decide when he flies thermal, and he needs to be able to, to count the time, means if he continues to fly or he thermals. And at the end of the day, the best pilot uh, wins, which is exactly the imbalance between quite passive flying in thermals and progressive flying. Mostly the guy which risks a bit more, which is a bit more progressive flying, mostly wins. Let me see. You can still see my screen. How do I get back to that? All right, cool, okay. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. So when I ended that scene and I was flying the first world championship in, in um, Vipava, I would say I knew how to fly that triangle, I knew how to thermal, but um, I wasn't really able to do the tactics myself. So basically there it's important, of course, if you join the race, you have a supporter, which helps you at the end of the day to do this. So if you come now to a race to fly with us, you will get a you will get a helper, of course, which will help you to do the tactician and uh, to let you know when you when you thermal or however what you, what you have to do basically. So about the training, is there any questions so far, or I go into a, how to training? I can't see what you're supposed to share. Okay, now, okay, I'm good, okay. I'm learning my lessons. Good, okay. So, this is the basics. All right, so about the training. So, first of all, of course, um, there is the pilot. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if you go alone on the airfield or you go with some friends. Of course, it's always more fun um, if you have friends racing with you. Uh, on the other hand, it's important that you get in the air. And as more sessions you fly yourself, as, as better you get. And at the end of the day, you, can, you pretty much can ask every uh, pilot which is around at the moment, um, training is a very important thing and it doesn't really matter what day it is or how the conditions are the most important thing is that you go out and you get used to the task and you get used to to how to fly that thing then as we have uh, multiple classes like the light class the sport class and the scale and the sls class it really doesn't matter which plane you take and um, important is also that you have to be you have to feel quite comfortable with the plane you're flying in. It's way more uh, important than you have the best plane on the market. Because at the end of the day, if you have the best plane on the market, but you don't know how to control that thing, you're never going to win. So basically, you choose the plane you have already um, at home, I would say. You put one of our GPS systems in that plane, and you have to go fly as much as you can, get used to the task, if possible, join the race, get experience there, and take it from there. So definitely you don't have to go buy the best glider first and then enter the scene. That makes absolutely no sense. Um, just fly what you have available and, and go from there. At the end of the day, also to set up your glider, which we're going to do in another episode, um, is one of the most important parts at the end of the day. And you will see flying around that triangle course in general, if you get used to it, you're not just getting a better pilot sooner or later, you will feel it quite uh, 
quite quick how much you're improving yourself. You will also learn how to improve your glider um, without actually doing much at the beginning. Basically, just doing the task will help you a lot already. Is there any questions so far? Let me go. Getting better slowly. Chat. Right. Now I see. Okay, cool. <laughs> At least you can see that. Okay, so I go back to the page then. Uh, da, da, da. All right. Then there's this other topic, the weather. Um, in the beginning, when I was flying, I always thought the weather has to be perfect to do as, as many rounds as possible, which is absolutely not true. The most important thing is that you learn how to fly in all kinds of different weather which are around, because that, at the end of the day, just makes you a better pilot. I can make an example. For example, um, I was flying last Thursday on, on, on my field here in, in Eglisa by myself with um, with the water ballast the RSV-17 I had from the World Championship in Spain last year. And there were some quite brutal thermic thermals with uh, almost three meters of, of climbing. And next to it, of course, there were, was really bad air. So I was falling down pretty much after two laps. I was a bit above the trees, I would say around 70 meters. Um, fully ballasted with 19.7 kilos, which is 150 gram, like the rules are. And, and I had no option pretty much then to release the water. And I found a thermal at a really low altitude and I climbed back up to 500 and then was able to complete some other rounds and made, I think, like seven or eight laps at the end. So basically, it, basically doing five to ten laps and fight for it is at the end way more interesting than flying those record flights, for example, we do. If you have amazing weather, you can do up to, we know, 17, 18 world record, 21 laps, which is very exciting because you have to be very concentrated. But um, to be a complete glider at the end of the day or a glider pilot at the end of the day, you need to be able in any kind of weather to fly as good as you can. And mostly are the flights which low lap rounds, let's say two to eight, are way more interesting than the, the laps uh, higher above. Because mostly on races, the guys um, having good air similar um, scores, which I would say probably if it's a good flight, they have 12 or 13. So the point difference is never um, as, as drastically is as if you have a flight where one guy does four and the other does two, which is really drastically in, in points. All right, so far so good. I go back quickly to see if there's any questions. All right, not, so I continue, great. All right. <clears throat> so next one up, which is really important, is the start, okay? I mean, that's also very important for you guys uh, for a training session, for example. Um, you have to be able to start below the altitude, which is, I get, let's take the scale class, for example. So you have to be able to start below 500 meters at the speed below or as close as possible to 120. And I recommend you to take a SLS plane or self-launch plane, whatever what you, what you have, or a light class plane, for example, and, and just train starting because you do have to be able to start any time as close as possible to those 500 meters as fast as possible, of course. And this is something you should not learn during a weekend racing with, with some other guys. This is something you should learn uh, yourself, training on the field, because this is something you, you cannot do by luck. Or, 
probably you can do it by luck, but the best would be if you if you can just nail it. So that's very important. And there's one very important key fact is um, if you have the, the wind from the tail or you have the wind uh, pushing against your nose. So basically when you're flying into the triangle, I do have a model here. Okay, ah, wait, let's have a feature. Look, I have a little ice with everything to do with that. Okay, so if you have the tailwind, that plane gets pushed so much quicker. So if you're a little bit too high in altitude and you push your glider down, especially at a, a pretty high uh, wing load, it's accelerating like a, like a rocket. So basically you have no chance. And you have to imagine if you have to do a reflight, turn around, go back into the wind and turn around again, you do lose a lot of altitude. So basically, when you have a lot of tailwind, you have to make sure that you hit your start as good as you can. And what mostly helps, if you go a little bit lower to enter the triangle that you normally do. Let's say, for example, um, if I fly the scale class, I would say I release the toe, the plane, the toe plane by about 530 meter, and then I get prepared. Uh, close to the line, I would say like 200 meters from the line and between 230 and 220 meters I would accelerate towards the line and and end the triangle then. On the other hand, if you have the tailwind and the tailwind is really strong, I would recommend not to start above uh, 510 meters because that makes quite diff uh, quite drastically different as you cannot really accelerate the plane anymore you basically have to go straight over the line Are there any questions so far i'd love to have that picture on the side but i'm not able to all right Let's see you have a question here okay no that's fine all right so let's go back to the view All right, the next one is something you can also learn by yourself. Maybe you, you all heard about the, the triangle index. So after you, you made your first triangle flight, you see on the Albatross app, you can see below all the data, how much altitude you needed for the lab and so on and so on. And there, there's this index. And I know there's a lot of talking about that index all the time. And there's also quite some different um, um, usage of that index, I would say. Some pilots are really like to go um, further around the triangle, always staying in the best air possible. Some pilots try to go around the triangle as precise as possible. So basically, that's your other training session, I would say. You should be able to fly with a with a scale plane, I would say an index between 110 and 120. So at the end of the day, if a race has been 20 minutes past, also 20 minutes past already, and you, um, your navigator tells you to, to accelerate, you need to be able to fly index between 110 and 120. Of course, if you can go below 110 is even better, just make sure you're not missing those uh, corners. This is pretty much uh, most important because it takes much more energy to turn around. Okay, ah, I can see here. Fly straight line, start, do fly straight. Up. All right, sorry. Um, about the start in general. So basically what I try to do it's always, I have the screen in front of me, which I'm not looking as much anymore as I'm used to, um, of course. And then I'm trying, let's say, um, I'm, as I'm standing on the ground and you're starting in this direction, I'm always trying to fly first over the line in this direction to actually see where I'm standing um, to see where the plane should be. And I try to memorize uh, that position. Then I fly away into the other uh, direction. 
I look at the altitude I have and I turn around and then accelerate, of course. And I always try um, pretty much to fly in as good as I can on the, on the, on the perfect lineup. It depends a little bit um, on the speed task, for example, on the wind direction. So I'm trying to choose um, to go rather from a little bit from the left or from the right. But basically, I'm always flying straight over the line. Speed is the ground speed or the airspeed. I learned from Andrew it's a 3D speed. <laughs> if I'm wrong, he <laughs> <you> can correct me. <laughs> so basically, I would what I would recommend you guys, as I said last time, how I have my albatross set up. Um, I have the starting page always on the first row. I have the altitude, then I have the speed, and on the right side I have the penalty points, and below I have um, entry altitude and entry speed as also penalty. So if my navigator looks on the, on the screen as I'm flying in or I'm training myself so I can see um, how good that flying was. And this is something you just have to, to try a few times and, and then you'll be fine. Ah, by the rules. Okay, thank you, Andre. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so if you have that start dialed in and if you have to, that triangle dialed in, then the next thing you have to learn is uh, the time management. You have to learn how long is one of those laps uh, or how long does it take your plane to fly one of those laps. And if you take the scale class, I can give you a figure. A normal lap at normal speed, I would say, is around 2 minute 20. As soon you fly a little bit faster, I would say pff, 2 minutes. Average to 20 to 30. 230, mostly if you, if you uh, fly a bit slower, 230 is something you can, you can calculate on. And then, of course, it goes down to way quick rounds. So this is something at the end of the day you have to be able to calculate and to be able, if you have 10 minutes left, how many more laps can I go? And you should be able to tune your plane in that way that you are able to make rounds which have similar times, I would say, that would help your, your navigator a lot. And then is that other word again, which I'm very happy to bring out, it's the progressive flying. So I would say, in general, if you are a too progressive pilot, uh, which means can be also be aggressive pilot, um, you're mostly gonna gonna miss out on many thermals, and you be you be the first one down, but probably you have a few laps uh, instead of uh, having multiple fla uh, laps. But for your training session, I would really recommend to fly as progressive as you can. Because to, to get a better GPS pilot, it makes no sense to fly in, grab that one thermal, go as high as you can, and then glide down. Because it, it's just not working out. Because it's much, much better if you fly in, you get a thermal, you decide rather if, if, if it's a good one, a strong one, or just a too light one. And then you continue to fly and you try to find another thermal. Because you have to be mental, mentally that strong that if you exit the, uh, that one thermal you have been in, you have to at least believe that you're going to get another one. <laughs> if you're not believing that you can get another one, you're already you already lost the battle. And I would say this is the balance between um, between an average pilot and a very good pilot. The very good pilot is probably, if there is a thermal out there, he's able to catch it at the end of the day. And, and what is even more important than something you also have to learn, for example, uh, to decide which thermal is, um, you should stay in and which one you should uh, fly through, pull your plane up and continue. Because sometimes there's bubbles, just bubbles, or what's even, even worse, um, there's thermals 
which especially when you have winds on some fields from any kind of directions uh, that you are flying with the wind away from the track in the wrong direction this is pretty much the the worst you can do so basically for example how i do that okay get my plane out again okay so you have that plane right and let's say here's your turning point one and you're coming towards the turning point one and the wind is uh, towards your nose you start to thermal here because you can feel there's a strong thermal and that thermal takes you away from the point and as you finished let's say you made a 50 meter plus you continue you come to the same point where you've been before at the same altitude again it's something which happened many times to many pilots so you always have to make sure if you have a situation where you're close to the turning point and the thermal is getting you away from the turning point that you go to the turning point and and get it before you go into the thermal sometimes it's a risk i know because uh, sometimes the thermal is disappearing so quickly in certain direction that you're not able to catch it but i would recommend you for the training that you do um, push even harder to go to the next turning point and try to fly back because you do get a certain feeling on the ground um, for wind and 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 um, in which direction the thermal will disappear the same hand that's also very important for you to know before you launch uh, from the ground you should um, focus on where the wind direction is pulling you towards so that's how you also able to plan a bit better um, which turning points you're going to get and which ones are not as not as important to take is there any questions so far great all right go quickly out here So you see there's, um, there's many parameters which, um, of course, many of you watching, you all know that game. At the end of the day, it's, it's the best pilot is the one which gets all the parts um, together. But I would say, as we're talking about training, it's very important to go out, go out there on your field at any kind of condition and, 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 and try to fly certain um, aspects and get used to it and train um, certain points let's say you go now and you say today i learned a bit uh, i try to learn how to proper start or try to go around the index and especially if you have days which the wind is quite strong i would even more recommend you to go fly because as more wind you have as more difficult it is as better you get because if you can fly in stronger winds you can also fly in light winds and even better, of course. Yeah. Okay, Dave Woods. Um, which wind direction is the best when flying in a triangle and which is the worst direction? I would say that you cannot even make a call is this, if this direction is better or worse. Of course, what helps a lot if you do not have strong tailwinds uh, during the starting sequence because that's quite of tricky more tricky to to enter the triangle of course um, in general it really doesn't matter where the wind is coming from the important thing is that you as a pilot or at least your navigator um, does know um, where the wind is blowing from and accordingly to that um, tells you to take the turning point in advance or after because you know the best thing what can happen for example if you have here turning point number three and you have here turning point number uh, number one so you have to come from three to one and there is a thermal starting at three pushing you with the wind towards one this is the best you can have or 
let's say one to two or wherever direction uh, you have to go if the wind and the thermals pulls you exactly towards the um, towards the next turning point you should also um, be able to thermal because you're not losing as much time um, thermaling in a in a zone which you have to go across anyway instead of flying away and and getting the next one right i hope that helped a bit <clears throat> in in general as i said before if i if i if i would be one of you guys and you go out there and train um if you're doing two laps and you're down at 150 meters i would not give up yet because um you learn a lot especially in the lower altitude because you do know as higher you are as as easier it gets and if you just uh, go out there and you're flying into a triangle uh, get the first thermal and then go up as high as you can and stay up there you will never get much better because you're just avoiding the the the, the real trouble which you um, which we saw in the last few years incredible um, pilot skills i would say in the euro top in the euro tour when people were getting so low and you think oh he's never going to make it and then he pulled it back up and there you basically can see there you can see how how, how good those pilots are i would say like there's so many out of uh, out there so it's it's really incredible all right so i would say i can go past that I can go past that training thing. If you have other any questions on the training thing, of course, I will do the microphone later on. Otherwise, I would go into the technical part. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> so I share my screen again. So So, the tactical part. <clears throat> so what always helps, of course, if um, I said before, if you go training by yourself, of course, it's still better to go instead of staying at home. Go by yourself and, and learn as much as you can. What always helps if you go uh, a few guys together, I would say it's not, it's not needed that you have more than two to, two to three pilots joining you. And I would say you should make sure you're entering um, the course as much together as possible so for example if i go training with my with my friends here we have a, we have a, a, a whatsapp chat group and we all have the same glider and we actually do um how is that called we all store together so we say start now and everybody's entering the line at the same time and then it's a tactical game. One guy is pushing more, the other one is um, holding back, uh, taking a thermal. And this is something you do get much better, a much better GPS pilot in very, very short time because you do learn so much from the others which are racing with you or also from the mistakes the other did which you did not make if you're doing the best way <laughs> that's also an option of course <clears throat> then um the navigator help is actually the best thing uh, it's actually the best thing about the tactics in general so basically if you do train by yourself which is very good possible now with the albatross app as you have all the the, the beeping and help you you need to if you do get then um, a guy on your on on supporting you a navigator which helps you about tactician which helps you about timing and so on and that's very important and this will help you a lot during the race so for example if you come to join us at any kind of race and um, and you have a navigator supporting you it's already i would take um would say taking half of the pressure of your general flying because you do can trust him and he will um, help you of course to go around the track but said this as you're not always able to have the same navigator with you or let's say you're new to the scene and um, it's also very important that you try to always 
kind of um, learn everything by yourself. For example, we had at the World Championship um, a few years back, I saw that that um, some people had navigators which they were not flying before with them. And there's rather the option that a pilot is so skilled that he asked the navigator for certain parameters. Let's say he asked, hey, where is this guy? Where is that guy? Where is he going up? Um, how many laps do the others have? And so on. Pretty much asking your navigator uh, about tactical tips. And on the other hand, if you're very used to your helper or you do know you have a very good helper, you can pretty much uh, leave all in your hands and, and sorry, in his hands and he does the tactical um, decisions, which I would recommend, uh, especially in the, in, in the first few years. So basically you focus on, on flying and your navigator actually says, hey, you have to fly faster. Hey, you have to fly to that thermal where the others are. So if he's doing the tactical uh, approaches for you, that helps you a lot already. And I would really recommend also, um, of course, to think about it yourself when he, when he tells you that. But at the end of the day, a navigator is here to support you and he will always do the best decisions um, for you as possible and and that's for you can totally focus on the flying and at the end of the day you have to be able to fly the the glider as good as you can around the triangle and this is most important at the end of the day if the tactical um, approaches from your navigator work perfectly you're even able um, to win of course any questions there Otherwise, we go to the next, to the starting window. That's a very tricky one, okay? <laughs> so basically, you guys know there's a starting window. It uh, depends on how many um, pilots are entering. And, and it's quite cool because, as you know, we have the, the several classes. I would say the scale class in one to three is the most difficult one because you have to be, um, you have, to have a toe up with the toe plane so you have to line up in the lineup and and then launch from there in the sls class you're launching yourself so basically you can fly in and um, when the gate opens and if you're fast enough you can also fly in a second time which is of course tactical wise the most challenging one so i would really recommend you if you go uh, if you're going to join a race and you flying the self-launch class, let's light class, ball class, or SLS class, I would really recommend you to start as, as fast as you can, as one of the first ones off the ground. So first of all, to avoid the traffic and the ground when the guys are actually um, realizing that they are too late. <laughs> and on the other hand, also to just get you a bit, little bit of space to get yourself uh, into position. So basically what I would do is, um, you know, let's say when this, the window starts at 10 sharp, I would start a little bit earlier, which is allowed according to rules. And then I would get into starting position and enter the starting line as soon the window is open. At a race on the weekend, of course, you're flying with a navigator. So I would totally recommend to do um, to do get all the the procedure about timing about the start and how long the window is open and um, the navigator really needs to take care about that we we have seen so many <laughs> mistakes i mean i did some crazy mistakes myself looking at the the time from my 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 samsung pad and the pad had the wrong time and i missed the gate and stupid things so you really have to make sure before you launch you actually know when the window opens and when it closed. Said that, the cool thing about the electric classes is that you can launch as many times as you want, as long that window is open, okay? So for example, if you're entering as one of the first ones, I would really recommend that you fly a lap or you see how the air is and uh, you get a little bit of a feel. And of course, your navigator, and if you're able to yourself, you look a bit around and you check what the others are doing because 
some are holding back, some are still trying to get the batteries from the, from the car because they missed to charge them and so on. But do not focus on that. Just look what the others are doing, which are flying and decide from there. And said that what's very important, you should also do in your training sessions, you should try to launch again. So let's say if you flew in and you did, it did one, two laps and you have lost maybe 100 meter and so on, uh, start your engine again, go up, um, activate your tab, tablet again to restart and start and learn by yourself a little bit how much time you need for that. It's a very personal thing. Some people are faster. There's also the difference between no, nose power, the face systems or uh, club trip which, um, which have different time parameters. So you have to be able to pull the engine out, launch up again and fly in before the window closes. There's nothing worse to be, to be flying in when the window is closed um, only realizing when you when you landed that you actually missed the, the the window. So I would really recommend if you're a guy which is new to the scene, um, anyway, start as early as you can, get a little bit of a feel uh, for it and take it from there because it really makes no sense to fight the top pilots uh, which are mo mostly gambling against each other to get a certain advantage. I should, you should stay away from that game in the beginning. Of course, if you get to a certain level, um, it's part of the game, which is very, very interesting. Any questions about starting in general? Can I go from there? Okay. So I go again. <clears throat> All right, so the next one um, is, as I said before, to progressive racing and, and the next parameter focus on thermaling. So <clears throat> for if you train that progressive racing as hard as you can, you're able to fly a bit more passive um, during your doing your race against your your colleagues or at the Euro Cup or National Cup Challenge Cup wherever you want to race on, um, at the end of the day, you have to decide which, which tactics you chosen or choose at the beginning. So basically, it's always hard, but I tend to fly in and do one lap at the beginning, I would say, to get a feel for the air. What's even better uh, is if you're able to launch a little bit before the window opens and fly a little bit around the triangle to feel how the air is, which can go quite wrong if the air is quite bad because, you know, you're not allowed to tow over a 600 meter with your tow uh, plane. So you should, uh, according to rules, not go higher. So you basically do not have as much time left. What helps on that is if you're, um, before you actually launch, you look at the wind direction and you also look a little bit around if you can see some birds, for example. What's even better, um, if there was a group flying just ahead of you, um, you can you can look at them or you, you before you launch yourself you look a little bit of them and see kind of in which directions and the, the place is working the best so you can maybe go hide there a little bit before the starting or you even get, go into a thermal to wait there um, until the start the starting window opens all right so at the end, you have to race and you have to thermal. So you have those two things uh, managed so far. Then there's the time management. And the time management is something you can uh, learn yourself, of course. I think Andre is also in the development um, of that, um, that Albatross is telling you at the end 
how many laps you would be able if everything goes right um, to finish. So that's a really good support, of course. But at the end of the day, the flight is never going 100% the way you want to, which sometimes it's a um, positive fact for you. So the air is better, you can fly faster and, and, and do maybe even one more lap. On the other hand, it can be that you run out of, of, of air, which is mostly, or you run out of, of, of time, which is even worse. And I would really say you should learn um, that when you, let's say we take the scale class, for example, again. So if you have a window of 20 minutes, you can basically do whatever you want in those 20 minutes uh, in, in training, um, thermaling or flying around whatever you want if you're not racing against one of your colleagues uh, do whatever you want of course make as many laps as you can if possible um, the, 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 the very refined um, section is the last 10 minutes where you really have to decide um, from which altitude you can do um, how many laps so that's for I'm also setting on the Albatross app now um, on my glide page, the lower parameters, which you're able to show the time you used for the last lap and the altitude which you used for the last lap. At the end of the day, that helps you a bit. Um, don't get too confused because air changes all the time. So there is not much um, you can do about that factor um, altogether. So basically, if you do have a good feeling, or if you did have a good feeling for the last lap you did, and you did, let's say, a two minute lap, and you used a certain amount of altitude, I would like, or I would recommend you to try to do the same one again. If you see the air is not as good, um, pro, uh, fly a little bit faster maybe to gain some, some uh, to save some time. And if you feel that the air is actually going really well, you can maybe even um, fly a bit slower. Said that in general, um, time management and thermaling in general, you do know, um, I take my plane again. If you're flying on the track and there's a thermal and you enter it and you start the thermal, takes a lot of time. If that thermal is strong, it's well, <laughs> you can stay in there, of course. If the thermal is not as strong, don't waste your time staying too long in there. There's also the option that the thermal is just about to improve, of course. You can always take the risk. If that thing is very light and it's very late in the afternoon and so on, I would not stay in um, too long, for example. So there's something you really, really have to learn um, in a triangle flying, which is the, the dolphin style of flying. So basically, if you're coming with a certain speed and you feel some good air in your variometer, you pull the elevator, you take it, as soon as the variometer slows down again, you accelerate again. And said that this is not just um, pulling on the elevator, of course, I actually try to pull as, uh, as less as possible. That's also a, um, a flap setting thing, which I always uh, tend to put um, more flap over the wings. So I have a special um, uh, releaser like a how is it called Shebel on the on on the radio which I can um, put all the flaps a bit further down and try to get that good lift as straight as I can so basically I would also recommend you to to train that uh, certain thing this is one of the most important um, factors besides thermaling it's about knowing when to fly slower and take the good air and accelerate and go through um, the good air, which is, which is a very, very important thing. So basically, if you have that one dialed in, the thermaling dialed in, and your time management dialed in, 
you can do it. <laughs> All right. So the next point, which is something very important, which is something with um, many people also scared of, is the safety in, in racing, of course. I mean, maybe you guys saw already, we have um, or we changed since a few years some parameters in, in the rules about uh, thermaling which means each group, group A or B or one and two, however you want, um, gets a preferent uh, circling direction. So you're only allowed to circle in that direction. And that's very important because um, it's much, much easier if you wanna, if a second plane wants to enter the same thermal, if he goes into the same direction. It's much safer. I know um, it's something you do have to learn, um, thermaling in a pack, and it's something you can really do only during the racing. Of course, um, I always um, recommend you to not uh, go too aggressive into a thermal, which another guy is already in. The most easy uh, thing is always if one guy is in the thermal already, check the altitude of, of your friend if possible and try to enter it further out, for example. Never go into the middle of the thermal and try to push the other out or so on. Um, you're gonna miss uh, a few friends quite shortly. I see there's another question, I get this one. Safe racing. Ah, oh, safe racing. I oh, learned something. Okay, sorry. I'm the German guy. <laughs> All right. So, said this very important. Go further out and, and stay safe there. And on the other hand, also, it's, it's written down in the rule book, but that's something you really just have to, to know and never forget. If there's one guy thermaling, and he's thermaling um, on the main course where you actually want to fly through, fly around that group which is thermaling, go around to the right or go around to the, right, uh, to the left. And having said that, that's something at the, at the weekend race which your navigator has to be aware of. This is a very important factor of the navigator because as you know, um, as you're focused on your flying and your plane for it during the race, you're mostly just looking at your plane. So if it's ahead of you, a, gr a group of people thermaling, then it's the navigator's job to tell you uh, to go around on the left or going around on the right. This is something which is almost even more important than thermaling together, which is easier to... to um, to avoid collisions, I would say. And most things always happen when somebody's thermaling and somebody just flies through. The thermaling plane always has, um, has rights, so he should be the one um, you have to fly around. So that's very important. On the other hand, there's actually not much um, you can do wrong. I mean, never cross a plane um, how is that called in English? Optically? That's another thing which is really important, but it's something I would say you also do anyway on your local field when you fly with your friends. Uh, beside that, there's actually not much um, you have to take care of there. Of course, what always helps is if you fly a few guys together, because as you know, there's some thermals mostly um, always on the same spot. So you'll be, be thermaling with the two or three guys you're flying with in the same one. So you get used to, to that. And on the other hand, you just come to one of our races and you will get used to, to that in, in quite a short time. And I would say since we implemented all those new rules, not many things um, happened anymore. All right. Then the last point about tactics. <clears throat> I would say which would really help you is um, to kind of always try to train with the same guys or let's say create a team around. Even better if they fly the same um, gliders as you do, 
because they can get you a lot of feedback about um, about setting up their plane or let's say having their 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 own preference what they prefer and 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 you can improve your plane from there on the other hand which which is really great about flying as a team or always with the same guys is um, if you're going to the race of course you always have one time your friend as a navigator and one time you help him as a navigator and if you fly more often together you will see straight that you get um, much stronger as a team because you do learn at the weaknesses or also the positive things about your other half so for example some pilots need to be pushed to fly more progressive some pilots need to be pushed to thermal a bit more some pilots uh, tend to thermal at the wrong spot and and if you have a really good navigator which looks out for you and you can definitely also trust it's uh, probably the, the best thing you can have and it also makes a lot more fun um, than flying by yourself, of course. Any questions there? Otherwise, I go a little bit into more details about wing load. Okay. So I go to the next page. I would like to. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so here you can see um, the water ballast system I put in my RSV 17 for the World Championship. You can see there is a tank. The tank is um, hand laminated and it has two walls in the middle to make sure the water is not swapping too much um, around. And on the left side, you can see the, the window swiper water pump, which is called, and a Festo ventil, which is making sure that um, the water is not flowing out while I'm, I'm continue racing. <clears throat> so basically the idea behind, you guys know, we have certain um, wing load rules in all the classes, which are at the end of the day, if it comes down to tactic, very, very important. So basically you guys all know as more heavy that plane is, as, as further you get at the end of the day with the same, uh, same kind of altitude, or let's say you get faster to an end. Of course, if that plane is heavy, you're not able to thermal as good anymore as, as, uh, as if you have it empty. So <clears throat> the best, of course, is to have a water ballast tank like I have it um, in the fuselage, which is absolutely in the gravity zone. So means I have um, a sequencer on my radio, which I can release um, always 10 seconds. So if 10 seconds means a half a liter, it means a half a kilogram. And, 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 and that's how I can kind of choose how heavy I want to fly. At the end of the day, I would say if it comes down to racing, it's not about um, if you have a full, ball full ballasted plane or you have an empty plane, at the end of the day, you always know after the race, which one was better. But I saw during the World Championship, um, it takes a lot of uh, pressure um, about choosing the wing load of your plane. So if I would recommend you guys to fly your favorite glider, I would always would say go for a wing load around 100 gram, which, which is really beautiful to fly. The plane is not too heavy and also not too light. I would say if you go uh, far below 100 grams, you just do not get as far and just do not get as far as you want to, especially in good air. If you always fly too heavy, um, it's just more difficult to find the light thermals. Or I would even say if you're flying at 115 gram wing load, you're basically going uh, through a lot of 
uh, thermals without even realizing that they were there. <laughs> so that's why I really liked the option from the water ballast. So means I was always able to launch with the scale glider at full wing load of 115 gram, enter the course and decide after a while if I want to stay at the full wing load or reduce um, the wing load during the flight. I do know, of course, it's a bit more complicated than just have a certain uh, ballast, but I can give you um, two examples of a very impressive flight um, I saw last year when we were in Untermettingen. Unter um, there was Stefan Müller, which has a RSG 32 from Windwings, and he has, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I would say six or seven liter of ballast. So that wing, that plane has around, oh, I think 17 or 18 kilogram in total. So it's the percentage, which is incredible. So Stefan was flying at his full wing load with the full water in. And I was flying just after that world record flight from Florian, which he did 21 laps. So of course I thought the air is burning. So what do I have to do? I just pump up that RS-17 with as much lead as I can and it will be amazing, right? Um, it all came a bit different. We had really good air when we entered the course, but we had really, really bad air after around 10 uh, minutes where Stefan chooses um, to fly to the right side where there's some kind of a little cliff uh, towards uh, there and there was a little bird uh, thermaling okay so Stefan went there and I saw that there was a thermal everybody else was falling off the sky had to land and I and I followed him because I thought hey I think if I have one chance I have to follow him there and see if that thermal um, there will will take advantage okay so as we entered there, I realized that the thermal is not really strong and it also did not develop as nicely. So he released all the water and I had no water option and he climbed and I had to land. That's why I decided after that, uh, that amazing flight from Stefan that I do want to change uh, to a water ballast uh, system in my plane to also be able to, to join or to choose um, the wing load during the flight. Absolutely not the um, most important thing at the end of the day. Uh, but as I said before, if you fly the glider always around the 100 gram wind load, you have pretty much the perfect um, balance. Any questions about that wing loading part? Also light class, sport class? Blue sky and rain in turtles. How quickly can you actually uh, dump your ballast, uh, Daniel? Um, I have a ten, a 10 seconds, a half a liter. So I have, I have um, this one sequencer, which is uh, 10 seconds for half a liter. And I have one sequencer, which is um, one and a half liter, which is uh, 30 seconds. Okay, and thanks for that. No worries. And and what I would also like to to tell you guys in, in terms of water ballast, I had some previous models which we were playing uh, with water ballast in the wings, which is of course also a possibility, but I can promise you guys in the wings, as you know, um, you always try or you wish to have as light wings as possible to have the plane as 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 light and maneuverable as possible um, it's always the best to have the weight as centralized as possible so example if i fly my 17 uh, with uh, with metal ballast i also have it in the fuselage and if i put some in the wing i only do it in the first section because i learned from that water ballast and um, versions i had which had the uh, the tanks in the wings. I had once a Diana with six meter, which has the water until out here. And when you released a little bit of water, you, you felt really that 
the water is flowing around uh, the wing and you really didn't, you do not want to have that. Um, optimal wing load for spore class, Alex asked. That's, that's a really difficult one. I would say you will see now there's some new models popping up uh, shortly. You do know at the moment the wing load at spore class plane is about 75 um, gram. So it's different. I mean, you can take the Calvados, for example, um, which um, flies really, really uh, nicely also at longer wing loads. Um, taking the DNA racer, for example, I always actually fly it at full wing load, which is a seven kilo with the 75. Graham. Um, we did do some prototypes with, uh, with Yiri before. We even had a DNR race uh, below 5.5 kilogram, but we just learned that um, it, it wasn't going as nicely straightforward anymore. So you will see also the, the, the later gliders which are coming to the market now, which will be mainly used between 6 and 7 kilograms. Said this, um, if you want to purchase a, a sport class glider, it's not really always necessary to take the most expensive version of it because um, every layer pretty much gets below below a certain weight, which is really nice to fly. So I would, I, for example, the DNA, I have a, a basic version of it and it, it flies really well. Mr. Greenfield, water in the wings can be a problem if you need to drop, which is a uh, wing will be empty. <laughs> yeah, my intentions, I heard that said this. I want to tell you a nice story. So we were flying at, um, at uh, last year in, in France with our friends in Celestat and uh, Fabien had a DG. He had a DG and they had also water in the wings. And, and, and he filled up that, uh, that plane beautifully, all those wings with the water ballast, but at the end, the plane was too heavy <laughs> for the rule book. So he had to release the water again. And as you just said, it's very difficult also uh, for launching. Um, if the wing, for example, tempts to one ground, that one wing uh, loses a bit more water in the beginning, or as, as John says, just uh, wrote, if one wing uh, loses the water and the other one still has it in. It's not uh, the simplest thing in general. So I would really recommend, if you do go for that water ballast system, uh, choose the, the fuselage version. And yeah, I would say, uh, we're using that pump um, from the from the cars, which is really is not expensive and works really smooth. Some other do is with pressure. I know that some guys have played a lot with pressure. It's Stefan as well, which also works really well. But I would say that the pressure thing needs a bit more te uh, technician, and also you have to be a bit more careful not to flood uh, your fuselage and radio <laughs> inside your in your, in your fuselage. All right. So the team. As I said before, I wanted to show you that picture <clears throat> uh, from Spain which did help a lot um, setting up a plane is if you have as many pilots as possible flying the same plane. Um, of course, not all the pilots are sharing information. Most people do share the information. There are so many beautiful gliders out there. I would really recommend you to ask some guys um, to help you as good they can with the um, informations which are available for the planes and and then and then take it from there which helps the most i would say yeah pretty much i think that's about it i would like to open the conversations now to maybe ask some questions which could help some other ones i would say how can i enter all those guys uh, Andre, you want to do this or do I do that? Uh, yeah, if somebody would like to talk, just press unmute on your microphone setting in Zoom and then you can ask a question and once you finish, press mute again so you will not disturb others. 
So where do I have to push? Just in general, the guys, all of them single or how? Yeah, single because you can unmute all, but uh, that's not a good way. So if somebody has a question, write it or just unmute on your local PC and ask the question. So then you just wait. I would say it would also be very interesting to get some of you guys maybe share their own experience so we can talk about that shortly as we only did the technical uh, tr and training part this time would be quite uh, learnful I would say for most of the guys. Daniel, John Greenfield. Yes, Mr. Greenfield. Um, Talking about ballast and things, obviously it very much depends on the conditions. Here in the UK, we don't get the really big booming thermals that uh, I've seen on the continent, or not very often anyway. Um, and there can be a bit of an advantage in flying as light as possible, because it's a bit of a tortoise and the hare situation. Of course. Um, and I tend to teach guys uh, flying in the UK type conditions that it's better to be flying light and maybe a bit slow um, because if you're still in the air then you've got a chance of flying a thermal if you're flying heavy you're going to fly faster but you're going to be on the ground quicker therefore there's less time available to find this weak lift and keep going so it isn't always about be as heavy as possible um, there are times when being really light can actually be a benefit. So what, what, what wing load we're talking about then, for example, in England, or what would you recommend in, in your kind of area? Well, I fly, as you know, I fly mainly the sport class now. Yes. Um, but uh, down below uh, 60 grams okay. can be advantageous. I'm flying a, a GPS special from Valenta. Yes. And lightweight i'm flying that at five and a half kilos okay and okay. It, it floats very nicely and will climb on almost nothing whereas if i ballast it up to seven it goes very well um, it's got a good turn of speed but needs a much stronger thermal to go up as you said uh, when you couldn't drop your water ballast so it isn't always about um flying as heavy as possible it's it's good to practice flying light because the plane flies very differently it doesn't have the penetration it won't hold a straight line as well as if it's heavy gets bumped around a bit more by the weather but it's a good thing to practice i would say it's even it's also quite important that you have to get used to a certain wing load of your plane because um, you should not enter a race and realizing that the others are flying much heavier and then put the wing load on your plane straight away. You, the characteristics, as uh, John just said, uh, changes drastically on the plane, right? What about other guys from US? They're also here. I wonder how the guys in the US fly. Can any of the US crew, uh, say how they fly over there. Or the Dutch, or what else we have? We have, we have almost all the countries. Yeah, hi, da Danny, this is John Elias. Hi, the John. Hi, uh, yeah, we just got done flying at Montague this last week. And um, there, there were times when the conditions were really, strong okay. and uh and it was quite windy okay and i i really wished i was fully ballasted <laughs> when when uh, we had those conditions like you said i tend to usually fly at about you know half ballast you know probably around 100 grams okay and um but when the conditions were like they were in Montague at times, I think it would be really advantageous to be fully ballasted. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, after the flight, you always know best, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's great. So you had some good conditions during um, that time now. 
We did. Um, the the thermals were were very good, uh, but like I said, it was it, it tended to be really windy, which made um, you know ma made it hard to get a lot of triangles. But um, it made it was it was uh, made it very interesting. Okay, great. So. No, I'm really, I mean, we, we definitely all have to fly over to you guys to experience that thing. I think next year, I hope we can get together there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hoping next year we won't have a virus problem. No, no, no. Then we only focus on the flying virus, not the... the <laughs> <other thing. laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Thanks a lot for sharing this, John. Is there any other newcomer wants to say something? I would really be interested in uh, some guys, what did they experience um, learning how to fly GPS, for example. Is there anybody which would like to say something? Oh, we have even South African crew here. That's great. Daniel? Yes. Uh, it's John Mitchell from the UK. Hi, John. Um, I I, I I can be considered a newcomer, and I went to the Baldock, uh event last year with with John Greenfield and I learned an awful lot especially after Simon Thornton set up my model for me in terms of trimming it to, to thermal hands off and all that kind of stuff but I've got an interesting question I do not have access to a large flat field to practice on you were talking about uh, practice 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 being the best way to learn how to go forwards yes my question is, I've got access to two very, very good slope soaring sites. Is it possible to practice and learn significantly well enough using a, a slope site? Now, I appreciate you've always got lift there because <laughs> of the slope, but if, um, my only flat field option is, is my power field, and that's got a 400 foot or 122 meter height limit because it's on a main airfield. Ah. So I, I can't, I haven't got a large grass field where I can practice. So I'm either going to be restricted at 122 meters or I can go to the slope. What would be your advice? Which is the best to do? I would rather go to the slope because on the slope, I would, of course, uh, choose days which the, strong, uh, the wind is not too strong. So it's not uh, that difficult. And to learn how to fly uh, sharp indexes around that triangle, it can be made beautifully uh, on a slope. And also um, entering a triangle at a certain height in the right speed can also be uh, learned on a slope, of course. I mean, at the end, it's all about be able to control your glider and knowing uh, what your um, GPS system is telling you and convert it into flying at the end. Okay, thank you. No worries. Anybody else? What countries we have? Choco, come, Choco. Choco has to say something else. Oh. <laughs> So, Mr. Choco, what about some Dutch pilot information? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in the Netherlands, we uh, do have only two pilots right now. So, yeah, that's, that's not that many. So, but I'm trying to get some more people interested. And as you know, in the Netherlands, it can be quite windy. Uh, we do uh, suffer a lot of uh, south westerly winds. So that I would recommend to fly a little heavier than normal. Okay, okay. And how how would you see yourself um, as a pilot, Chaco? You're racing with us since many years. Are you seeing yourself a bit more progressive pilot or a bit more thermal pilot? I'm more progressive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That's good. I, I, I got one more question for you, Danny. Okay. When do you think we got the next contest going on? Is there any plans for that? Oh, I haven't said that. I actually wanted to start with that. Remember, I'm, we are planning at the moment um, the first kind of online race, which is going to be, you guys have to write that down now, is on the weekend 26th and 27th of 
June. Is this the weekend? Let me see. Uh, no, 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 no. 20, 27, 28. Sorry, 27, 28. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a race over two days, which you can upload your best six flights. So it doesn't matter if you do them on Saturday or on, on, on Sunday. And that the we're gonna do it over the Triangle League from uh, Pascal Brunner, so we'll be able to upload your flight there. And the beauty about it, you guys know, on the 15th, all the borders open again. So if you do believe that your friend's airfield is better than yours, you can just drive to him. <laughs> but um, going back to your question, Chaco, um, we are um, looking at all the options at the moment. We're also in contact with uh, most of the airfields, especially the bigger ones. And as soon we have the option to race again, we will pronounce as fast as we can. And we're definitely going to do a few races this year. Okay, very good. For example, Untermettingen should be nice, or, or Hegenberg, or maybe in Beach. Yes, yes. There is Untermettingen, uh, there is um, um, Hof Hegenberg we are talking to, and also we are talking to Grübingen, because you know we have the times pretty much when we were supposed to have the World Championship. That one, um, Neresheim is also, we're talking to them and also in Switzerland, we're trying. I mean, we try as soon as we can. We will also try to have uh, Vipava in autumn and um, let's see what we can achieve. Okay, Danny, thank you so much. My pleasure. Which uh, classes are uh, intended for this online race? Sorry, tell me again, yes. Yes, which classes? Uh, SLS or uh, scale or? Scale and SLS. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank thank you. you can just uh, take one of the big ones out and fly. Well, it would, will be difficult with our weather down in Vallito, in Medano. <laughs> I, I, I will make sure we have some nice weather so you can launch off your beautiful runway there. <laughs> we'll try to be there. <laughs> that would be great. I mean, that's, that should be anyway the idea that we kind of, um, all of us can uh, can join that race pretty much all around the world and and, and see on Sunday who has uh, the best flights. I'm sure Andre in Vipava will also have some beautiful weather and and we will see where we can meet. There's also some new guys which want to enter and let's see. I got a, a message that uh, Mike wants to ask a question but he's too shy. So can he please ask it now? before I'm going to bed. Do I need to release his microphone? I don't even know which one it is. I cannot see it. Maybe him? Ah, it's too many mics. Never mind. <laughs> so I guess we call it a day. Danny, before you uh, wind up, uh, good news about having a scale and SLS class uh, open event, but how about doing one for the sport class and even the light class on sort of other weekends? No, definitely. I mean, um, the first idea was pretty much to, to choose one class to start off the first uh, kind of challenge yeah. and, and then we take it from there. I mean, Beautifully, of course, would be that we can join again together and fly together at the Euro Cup. But definitely, we also will try to uh, have some online races in, in, in other classes. Um, the beauty, I would say, uh, that's why I, I, we wanted to choose the, um, the SLS or the scale class, is that everybody pretty much can join at the, at the local airfield. And therefore, we have the slope and and flat uh, spot problem a bit less, I would say. Okay, but I think it would still work, and and also would uh, be another opportunity to promote the light class as well. Yes, yes, I totally agree. I mean, we should definitely do it also in the other class, and we will, we will, of course, no worries. Good.
All right, guys. So I would say then we wrap it up. I would say thank you very much um, to Andre again that we were able to use uh, his channel. And that's why I made it myself tonight. I would really like uh, that we have future on some other pilots doing this, sharing uh, what they believe is important. And, and we take it from there. So I hope you guys have a great evening. And I hope to see you guys around as soon as possible. Have a good evening.